I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Weisbart again. He's the National Board Secretary, Missouri Chapter Chair for the Physicians for National Health Program, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that supports single payer national health insurance. Dr. Weisbart is a retired family medicine physician who's practiced for over 20 years at Rush Medical uh, Center in Chicago before he moved to St. Louis, where he became the Chief Medical Officer of Express Groups. During that time, he also volunteered as an assistant professor in clinical medicine at the Washington University in St. Louis, and also served as the president for the Consumer, Council's, the Consumer Council of Missouri. I thank you for your time and all the lessons that you've taught us, uh, Dr. Weisbart, and we look forward to one last uh, lesson that we can learn from you. One last hurrah. It's hard to believe, but here we are. Um, so, um, I believe we'll have time for some open general questions. So if there's things that you've heard me blather on about for the last few weeks and and we haven't had a chance to do questions and such, um, I don't think I have to run off quite as quickly. And I believe I've got today paced to be uh, a little bit less um, content and more time for discussion, a little bit anyway. So start thinking about what you, but it can be completely off topic, except, you know, stay in healthcare. But it can be pretty off topic if you want. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about basically two things for this next little chunk of time. We talk about um, so what? <laughs> Why should physicians care about this? Why do physicians care about this? Um, there's some pretty obvious reasons, but then I'll talk about some other sort of factoids that might be uh, useful for you to know. So we'll talk a bit about that, and then we'll... Um, talk a bit about how I got here, why I'm why I'm talking to you, why I'm spending my time on this. So that, that's kind of the run of show for my last dance with you. And uh, hopefully we'll um, have some time. So that's the topic for today. Um, here's welcome to the bad news. <laughs> um, you're joining uh, an unhappy lot of, of career people. Uh, American physicians are uh, among the least satisfied physicians in the modern world. Um, and this is before the pandemic. I don't think the number has been repeated since then, but we're not a we're not a happy group compared to doctors in other countries. And I know you know one of the patterns here is how insurance systems are set up, but we're we're not that happy. And and question would be of course why? And I think it's interesting to stratify the why uh, by where we are in our career paths and and how old we are. So for Millennials, Generation X's, and Boomers. Millennials, as you can probably imagine, just you know, will tell you, there's just too much bureaucracy. There's too much charting, too much paperwork. I really, you know, this is, you know, 2024. Why, why would we have so much of this stuff? Generation X, um, on the other hand, says there's too much bureaucracy. All this charting and paperwork. Why? And the 20 and Boomers say there's just too much bureaucracy, charting, paperwork, and you know, so. The message is we're all saying this, obviously, because uh, it feels pretty stupid that we have to set up a system like this. Um, and um, this all sort of leads to something that I believe Diljit Singh, uh, Dr. Singh, you know, the vice president of PNHP, uh, is going to be speaking to to you, to, to about to you sometime in the next, this week, sometime in the next couple of days, I think tomorrow evening or Wednesday evening, I forget which, but she's uh, she's terrific about this. And I'll give you a taste so that it's familiar. I'm not going to do very much, but uh, she says that moral injury is the better term or is is a different term than burnout. You know, we're, there's a lot of talk about physicians being burnt out um, and that they're retiring early and all this stuff. And a better better term is this emerging thing. Burnout implies that it's your fault, that you don't know how to organize your time or that you're 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 somehow not meditating enough or something. Uh, moral injury describes something very different uh, and much more prevalent, frankly. Moral injury is the notion that um, that we know what to do for our patients. We've worked hard to get to do what we would love to do for our patients, but yet there are these systemic barriers over and over again uh, blocking you from, from, from doing it. Um, you do the hard work, right, of a, of going to med school and going to residency and then walking into a, a very small room with someone you've never met before and and um and establishing rapport making them feel comfortable and eliciting from them uh the gist of what's going on and then negotiate coming up with thinking through the treatment options and negotiating it and then um, and that's great 
and uh, and then the patient leaves, you know, hopefully happy, and they come back uh, an hour later and saying, I can't afford that, or the insurance company won't pay for it, or two days later, you get a denial for it, and you think, oh, dang, damn it, let's try something that's not as good. And then you go into the next patient and you have the exact same thing happen. It happens over and over and over again. And these systemic barriers from the business side of care are just, they're killing us. They're killing, they're literally killing our patients and they're perhaps literally killing us. So this moral injury uh, is a consequence of, uh, of the structure in healthcare and how we, why we're all so aggravated. And of course, there's a way forward. This is the great book about this uh, by Wendy Dean and Simon Talbot. You should know that they are not single payer advocates. They still believe the free market is a way to solve it. Um, so, um, but it's a really good, I think they're wrong, <laughs> but it's a really good description of how, what's going on and, and how the system does creates this problem. And, uh, and PNHP is embarking on a study uh, to, to look further into that. Uh, and I believe Dr. Singh will probably unpack that more to you. So bureaucracy. Um, you probably have heard of EPIC. EPIC is one of the electronic medical records. It's very common all over the country. Uh, and EPIC is different in every hospital and in every clinic and in every country, frankly, because it's just software. So they can they can modify it to fit whatever that country or clinic wants. So these researchers went around and, and extracted from EPIC, which you can do in an EMR and you can't do in paper. They extracted from EPIC the average number of characters per progress note uh, in an ambulatory patient, the average number of characters, fascinating. Um, and it turns out that around the country, around the world, um, the average number is about a thousand. A typical progress note in Canada, UK, Australia, and such is about a thousand characters long. In the United States, it's quite different. With no overlap, interestingly, in the study, the average progress note in the United States is about 4,000 characters, literally four times as long. So when you're in clinic and you're and you're going, entering your progress note into Epic or what or any EMR, frankly, um, and you feel like three fourths of what you're doing is not adding any clinical value, that's because three fourths of what you're doing, three fourths of what you're doing, is not adding any clinical value by coincidence. So, you know, it's not, those countries, remember, they have longer life expectancies than we do. So the clinical note that they're getting is clearly adequate for medical, for clinical needs. And yet our notes are so much longer. Why are our notes so much longer? I argue that it's for two reasons, primarily. One is for medical legal risk aversion, right? The attorneys tell us that if we didn't document it, we didn't do it. So we document like crazy to, uh, to uh, get our um, our, our um, malpractice suit prevented. Um, and then secondly, because of how complicated the reimbursement model has gotten. So if you think about those, malpractice um, doesn't disappear. I mean, malpractice lawsuits don't disappear under single payer, but why does somebody sue? They sue you because they had a bad outcome, your fault or not your fault, they had a bad outcome. Now maybe they uh, can't work, maybe they lose their job, they lose their health insurance, so they sue. The biggest reason to sue is to re, is to have somebody pay for the future cost of healthcare, and the biggest piece of a judgment against us when there is one is to pay for the future cost of healthcare. So the reasons to sue plummet under single payer, and the size of the judgment against us plummets under single payer. So malpractice becomes an ordin more ordinary issue for medical practice rather than. Uh, the dominant issue that it often is in people's minds uh, today. Um, so, so that under that re removes one of the biggest reasons for why we chart like craziness. And then the other reason, of course, the reimbursement model. Well, we can set up a far more sensible reimbursement model than the complicated um, risk avoidance things that are going on in uh, in reimbursement models today, profit centric things. So. Would that mean under single payer, you would immediately be able to stop doing three fourths of your charting? No, of course not. But if you reduce the drivers of the problem, um, then then that improves things. Plus, you know, these long, complicated progress notes aren't just annoying to write; they're actually harder to read. It's harder to really understand what you yourself thought uh, last month when you saw somebody, let alone to understand what one of your colleagues did. So, it's a good metric of how we waste our waste our time, um, and. And perhaps because of those two metrics that I just said, uh, driving driving malpractice, um, malpractice rates in the United States are 
phenomenally worse than they are in Canada. In Canada, so uh, this is just the rates for Missouri. Uh, every state, the average filed rate for malpractice is, is quite different. Some states, it's actually pretty comp. Wisconsin is actually pretty comparable to uh, the Canadian uh, malpractice premiums, but in most states, it's like Missouri or even worse. Um, so, um, so it, you just look at those premiums; they're 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 powerful. Um, what about income under changing the topic a bit now? What about income under single payer? So here's here's current uh, data um, about uh, income in Canada versus in the U.S. And this is converted to U.S. dollars, and I used a 0.73 conversion factor because that's you know the loony is worth about 0.73 conversion factor. So some specialties, it's not. I'm not sure that all these specialties are completely correct, but they're they are from public data sources that I've listed there. Um, and of course, taxes are quite different in those in, in Canada than they are here. Taxes pay for your health care. Taxes pay for a lot of your other expenses. They So there, there's much more benefit from that. Hard to draw the exact equivalence to say what that means exactly, but understand that in Canada, at least, uh, physicians are paid uh, pretty well. A piece that we don't understand because we tend to think of it as, as our problem in our practices, but it's really not that exactly, accounts receivable. Um, this is again unique to the United States. Um, accounts receivable, maybe half of our this is this is stuff that you build an insurance company for. It's not charity that you wrote off. It's stuff you build an insurance company for that you're waiting to get paid for, and it tends to be uh, waiting a long time. Um, so think about that. Um, a quarter of the work that you do, you're going to wait more than three months to get paid for. That's not a coincidence. That's not an accident. That's a business plan by the insurance industry. That's not that's not your office manager's failure. That's the insurance company strategy. And I'm here to tell you, when I was working at Express Scripts, we had a tremendous amount of infrastructure investment, inf information system investment, trying to figure out exactly how long we could delay paying a pharmacy for the prescription that they dispensed. Because if we delayed it too long, then we would have to pay a penalty. So we had systems to maximize how much is the stock market returning on the investment that we're not paying back to the pharmacy. We're sitting on the money. Um, how much can we make off of that? How big is the penalty? When does the penalty exceed the amount that we can get on the stock market, on the money that we're hoarding? There's a whole system for that that I know we had uh, when I was working there. And I promise you, the insurance companies writ large have that all the time, too. So it's not these delays aren't your office manager's fault. They are a business plan. Understand traditional Medicare doesn't have this problem at all. Traditional Medicare averages about 14 days. You submit the claim. And now Medicare Advantage has the delays, but traditional Medicare typically pays all of their claims within about two weeks because they're not trying to get the return on capital that they're hoarding, hoarding from us. Another reason. Um, so, um, I mean, the most common pushback you hear from uh, folks, when, from physicians, when we're thinking about do we want to support single payer or not, is the the, the fear that they're going to be paid less under under single payer. And so here's here's three analyses uh, ranging from relatively progressive to remarkably conservative uh, analyses, looking at this. And all three of these analyses uh, have concluded that yes, um, we can we can we can afford to do single payer in the country. We will actually um, spend less on healthcare, uh, and that does. And none of them included figuring in paying physicians less. So all three Mercatus uh, Center did a study that was funded by the Koch brothers, and I view that as uh, a group that has a relatively conservative um, orientation. Uh, compared to the Urban Institute that has a relatively progressive orientation. Um, and, and they all started with the same number in their studies. They all said that the current system was paying total payments to physicians of $668 billion because these were fact-based fact analyses. Um, and, and the Mercatus uh, study um, said that we, under Medicare for All, we would increase the amount of money we paid physicians um, by $13 billion, $23 billion. $13 billion. Um, you do the math. <laughs> $13 billion. Um, we would increase the amount we pay physicians and yet um, and yet be able to afford it. The country would spend less on health care. The Rand Institute, very comparable. Urban Institute, even more striking. So the point is nobody out there, when you hear people say, when you hear physicians that you're trying to discuss this with say, um, we're gonna under we're we're gonna have to take a big loss in what we're being paid. You can't if you pay us Medicare rates, we're gonna go bankrupt. 
Um, well, nobody is suggesting we pay doctors Medicare rates. That's not the proposal. Um, yeah, let me pause. I'd like to hear you. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess regarding these economic models, do you know by yes. any chance if um, the Medicare for all column, um, that increase applies to residents as well and their salaries? Don't remember that being included, but let's talk about resident, uh, resident, um, um, residents. Let's talk about medical students. We talked we talk about medical students, didn't we? That there's a business case for uh, for paying for medical school. Did I, talk, I think I talked about that with you last last week. I haven't seen anybody address what it means for uh, GME programs. Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. I don't. I don't know if that's in there or not. Why do you ask that? I don't know. I was just watching a video um, like a week or so ago, just about like resident salaries. So just residents have been on my mind for whatever reason. Hmm. You know, I don't. That's a good, interesting question. I don't. I don't know the answer to that. But the, the community it probably does, but I don't know that because it's funneled through hospitals. So I I can't tell you that. I can't tell you the answer to that. Um, but at any rate, when you hear folks saying that they're worried that they can't live on Medicare rates, first of all, understand nobody is proposed a fee schedule <laughs> there isn't the, the bills on the house and the bill in the senate don't actually have a fee schedule built into them so um if there isn't a fee schedule built in that doesn't say use current medicare rates if that's not in the bills nobody's saying what you're going to get paid how do you know it's not enough <laughs> that's sort of a ridiculous argument when nobody's saying what you're going to be paid well but it's not enough you don't know that uh, other countries do what we're proposing doing and physicians are paid reasonably well um, and, uh, and so even, so if you're just, if you're just paid at parity to how you're paid today, you know, the, the physician, op the, your, your office expenses would plummet because you wouldn't have to manage your interface with the insurance industry. So I'm not terribly worried about this. Um, and, but, but the news is interesting because the news, the headline on the, on the Urban Institute study, uh, the headline from them argued that physician income would be squeezed. Isn't that interesting? Their headline that they published said physician incomes would be squeezed, even though their model <laughs> said the opposite. So, you know, always read past the headline, I guess, is the message. Um, you know that we did this report. Another reason why physicians want a uh, single payer, we did this report um, um, a few months ago that I think you've probably seen. And uh, the report goes through all of these uh, areas of of um, of harm uh, for patients and um, and physicians, um, and understand that the study was focused on Medicare Advantage, um, but it's just a you know it's just the MacGuffin. It's it's all over the place. Um, the same the same problems here are in are in the insurance industry at large, and so uh, let's look at just one. Of, I want to look at two of these factors. Let's start with this one. Look at prior authorizations uh, in the report we document. That physician practices average 14 hours a week to process 45 PA requests. The mean time for PA request, according to the Medical Group Management Association, is more than half an hour. If you do the arithmetic, and, the, and, and Kaiser says that there are 35 million prior authorizations uh, in the year 2021. If you do the arithmetic, that adds up to more than 20 million hours a year on prior authorizations, 20 million hours a year, physician and staff, not just all physician time. That's 2,300 hours a year, years of work. And the, you could translate that perhaps into tens of millions of more visits. So we're we're squandering uh, clinical resources on, on this and that that's painful. Um, and and the another reason why physicians are interested in this is we all are kind of sick of being employed. Um, you know, they were employed. So when I started giving my single payer talks 12 years ago or something like that, I would ask students who wants to go into, who's planning on going into, you know, private practice versus who's planning on going into groups. And, fr and frankly, 12 years ago, the rooms were usually split. Uh, 12 years ago, if I asked med students, they would, you know, I would say it was about half that was still wanted to go into private practice. I haven't seen, I don't think anybody or very, 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 no, there are some, but very, very few med students who tell me that they plan to go into independent private practices um, anymore. Not because they've shifted culturally and don't want to, but because it's just too hard. It's just too hard. Do you want to manage all these insurance companies? Do you want to be the one that has to train your staff on prior authorizations? No, it's just too hard. So we're employed, you know, we're, we're, we're largely employed now by some sort of corporate um, entity. And then those corporate entities don't just pay our salaries, 
but they they download the risk. They expect us to be the managers of their financial risk. That's a driver of moral injury that hurts us. That's terrible to go through because now then we have to, you know, prioritize, figure out how to balance um, all these things. And and rather than having our, our Hippocratic oath uh, of, uh, of respecting our patients and fo focusing on them first. So those are all reasons why people want to, and, uh, and we'll kind of cut this short here with this, which is this nice quote from the past president of, uh, of the American Academy of Family Physicians talking about healthcare. And he said, healthcare in the US is an incredible bureaucratic mess to get anything done for patients. Whereas in Canada, uh, his perhaps equivalent uh, it, in British Columbia said, practice, it's not a big hassle. I can focus on patient issues, not administrative issues. So let me tell you how I got here a little bit, because maybe that'll help you see pathways where you can get here. So it wasn't supposed to build like that, my bad. <laughs> well, I'm walking you through the whole part. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you can tell this was a last minute slide build. So on the left there is President Nixon signing in, into law the HMO Act. Um, when I was considering what I wanted to do in my life in 1973, uh, the idea that there would be um, managed care, that there would uh, really attracted me. The idea that there would be uh, a way for physicians to be, the idea was you get paid a certain amount, and then if you can keep people healthy, um, you get to make more money. If you do stupid things and let people get sicker or hurt them in some way, then you have to pay for that too. And then you make less money. So the it seemed to me that the idea of managed care was aligning physician interests with making more money. Um, and indeed with 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 make, keeping people healthy was our pathway to, to making to making more money. I thought that was a great idea. And then the the second box over there, that's his anchor medical office. That's where I worked for a couple of decades. And it was a it was an almost an entirely uh, prepaid capitated model because I really believed in that notion. And I eventually became sort of the the head of that group. Uh, and had profit and loss responsibility. And I'm pointing that out because then here I was, you know, a relatively idealistic person who had profit and loss responsibility for my group. I actually started thinking about things like, well, the next the next box is this guy with hemophilia. Uh, it's not actually him. It's a picture from, you know, from the web, but a patient with hemophilia. Because uh, he sort of got me, got me annoyed at myself. Um, so here he came in. Uh, we had our, our anchor was set up with um, 13, as I recall, offices around the city of Chicago. Each one was on its own profit and loss, for which I was ultimately responsible. And uh, and uh, this one in one particular suburb of Chicago was really profitable. It did great. They were really keeping people healthy. We thought they had been like, you know, all the vaccinations, all the pap smears, all the colonoscopies, all the mammograms. They were doing just gangbusters. Their patients loved them. It was really a great, great little success story. And then this guy comes in uh, and uh, in crush injury, you know, he worked um, environmental stuff and he got in crush injury and he had hemo uh, it revealed that he had this acquired form of hemophilia for which at the time he required a million dollars of hemophilia factor per year, uh, which was a lot at the time. And that was enough of a change that that office had to pay for that it would have taken this thriving, prosperous, wonderful little office into bankruptcy, this one patient. And so we didn't do any of these things, but I was thinking of things like, well, gee, you know, why don't we, um, we know that it's him calling. Why don't we put him on hold when he calls? Uh, why don't we lose his record a couple times? Why don't we, um, why don't we make him wait extra long in the office? Why don't we get him to think, you know, I don't know what happened to that office. It used to be great, but uh, you know, it's gone to heck now. I'm going to go find another doctor. Why don't we kind of nudge him in that direction? Um, that would have saved us a million dollars a year. Would have rescued the the group, and we would have been able to help all the other thousands of people more. We didn't do any of those things. But the fact that now, decades later, I'm still aghast and atoning for the fact that I even thought of that shows you how corrupt this model of capitating and putting physicians at risk are, how corrupt the model of corporatization can be on physician mindsets. I, I, I like to think I'm relatively resistant to that. And yet here I was dealing with the potential bankruptcy of that office. We came up with another solution for them. But dealing with their potential bankruptcy, I thought of a bunch of strategies to make him not like us and get him to go to some other doctor. What a terrible thing. So I still hadn't given up on the model, though. I still hadn't given up on that. And I went to work, as you know, um, at Express Scripts, 
a pharmacy benefit manager. And I thought, well, that's great. You know, we sell drugs, you know, we, you know, we make more money, the more drugs people take, you know, so, you know, we can do things that improve adherence to medications. So let's do things that would improve adherence. Uh, and then we can make more money and we can, if it's an important, useful drug, like at the time I thought statins were, we can save lives. It's uh, again, a win-win culturally. Great. Um, so that was one of the first things I tried to do uh, when I went to Express Scripts to start it. I proposed to the rest of our executive staff that we that we create and wage a campaign to increase medication adherence with statins. I thought, well, that's great. You know, if we can increase adherence to statins from the 60% that people were usually at to 80%, then we've sold a third more statins and we make all that extra profit. And, you know, increasing statins will improve life expectancy, I thought, and I'm much more nuanced view of it now, but, but that's, I thought, great. So why didn't we do that? Because the pushback I got, um, remember um, PBMs use uh, or have as clients insurance companies and employers, right? So um, they, they asked me, the executive staff asked me, well, how long do you have to be on a statin for it to actually prevent a heart attack? Thought, Probably 10 years, you know, 15 years, I don't know, before, you know, the population actually shifts. It takes years. They said, well, that's kind of a non-starter because, uh, most uh, insurance companies know that they have 20 to 25 percent annual turnover in their membership. You know, an employer drops them, an employer picks up three more insurance companies, employer competes like that. People, patient or, or employees move from one employer to another. Most insurance companies know that they have 20 to 25 percent annual turnover in membership, even when their membership is flat. They have 20 to 25 percent. That means that two years from now, more than half of their mem of their members and the insurance company are going to belong to some other insurance company. So if the insurance company does a campaign to increase adherence to statins, that's going to take 15 years to pay off in terms of preventing that heart attack that's so expensive. Well, they will have invested in the campaign. They will have done the education and trained people to be adherent. And then the patients will leave and go to another insurance company to re reap the benefits of that. So how are we supposed to, to compel an insurance company to invest in this program we have to charge for? Because there would be some expense to doing this. Um, so we never started the program. We never did an adherence program in Stanton's because the ROI to our clients was inadequate. That really kind of pushed me over the edge of thinking this whole fragmented system is just unacceptable. So anyway, what I try to do with you all is to give you a foundation for what you're thinking of. And this isn't just me. I mean, I, the reason that I'm so into this program that Betty and Marvin and and and, and everyone else is, is run for you is I want you to have this foundation of a comprehensive landscape, how to think about issues in healthcare. And I promise you 10 years from now, whatever the crisis is in healthcare, it'll be different from the ones that we think are the crisis today. And, uh, and hopefully in this course, you've gotten the foundation so you know how to think about and analyze those things when they come up and certainly apply them to the issues today, but for the future. I also want you, when you go back to your to your school, you'll probably immediately notice that you know stuff that your classmates don't know. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. I mean, you know, it's kind of fun. You'll have this little niche of expertise that, you know, as you say some things, hopefully your classmates will go, where'd you learn that? How do you know that? And you can answer the questions like the income piece, you know, what it'll do for salary. You'll have some beginnings of answers to these things. And that'll make you more confident to talk about this stuff. And it's it's confidence is really important because you already know, I think, that the majority of physicians kind of agree with us on this, but yet none of us talk about it for a whole wealth of reasons. But building your confidence helps kind of uh, break the ice on that and hopefully um, establish your brand, you know, why are it's it's really important at this point in your career to establish that you think of yourself as somebody who speaks about politics and speaks about policy it's important to establish that you are somebody comfortable thinking about thoughtfully 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 thinking about policy it's important for that to become part of who you are to get used to going out of the exam room to realize that 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 advocating for your patients in the exam room is great and there's also a whole lot of advocacy for your patients you have to do outside of the exam room. All the harms that, that the insurance companies do on your patients, you can't fix that from inside the exam room. You have to go outside the exam room. So learn, adopt in your brand that that's part of, of who you are. And so I hope that when you go home from this uh, five-week thing, you'll start organizing your, your classmates, so that you'll become 
um, leaders in PNHP. We've got several now uh, who graduated through this whole sort of program and are now on the board and leaders and, and have, had their, have, have really helped uh, the organization become more effective and more thoughtful. So I'm hoping that this sort of gradually launches you into that direction and then likewise become leaders outside of PNHP. You know, we, one of our board members just uh, uh, decided to, to not run again because he's going to be the head of of, uh, of the Academy of Family Physicians in the state that he lives in, the state, the state Academy of Family Physicians where he is. So, but now we have a really vibrant single payer person running that state or leading that state's program. So really important for you to think about what you could do within PNHP and outside of PNHP. And then how PNHP can kind of help you throughout your career. You know, um, I think I can't say for sure 100%, but I suspect 100% of the people who spoke to you over the last uh, few weeks, we're still here, right? We're still here. You know, I certainly am available to you. You know, you want to send me an email with some question two years from now, you can do that. You know, you want to have me on Zoom to speak to your your classes, your class about any of the things you heard me speak about. I'm eager to do that. If you, if we plan it far enough advance, I can travel to your area and and do that. So, you know, we're available to to help you with that. Or, you know, you want to write an editorial or an op-ed or something, and you want somebody to edit it to just sort of help you nudge, and I can quietly help kind of ghostwrite and stay in the background for you and give you feedback. Oh, you forgot this point. We're here for you. You know, you've got these new relationships. Um, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, has got like the most amazing congressional contacts. You know, she like can get herself into any place she wants. And I just was always wondering, does she do that? Does she like donate to all these campaigns? I mean, how does she have these? No, she doesn't. She has those. She has those connections because she, as it happens, went to Harvard met Harvard Law School, and so she met all these people that were at Harvard Law School, both professors, faculty, uh, family members of other congressional members. So she met all them and she built these relationships. And that was, you know, a couple of decades ago, or at least, I don't know how old she is, but, but so she has these doors and bridges and understand one of the covert message goals or accomplishments of this class is that you have these bridges. Um, so um, think of us as, as a place you can go to for, for life.